Hey everyone, how's it going? It's Blake here from ChessPathways.com and we're doing another game analysis video today for one of our members. So this is a game from a tournament, uh, Game in 65 Delay 5, so a longer time control game than some of these videos have been. And this was sent to me by Pierre, who had the black pieces here. Let's go ahead and flip the board to get his perspective here. And Pierre actually won this video as a prize for being one of the winners of the Chess Pathways Blitz Streak Challenge that recently concluded. We had a challenge to see who could get the longest online uh, Blitz Wing streaks, and Pierre was one of our winners from that challenge. If you want to partake in future challenges, they're free to enter. Just go to ChessPathways.com right now and sign up there. It takes five seconds, and you'll never miss a future challenge. All right, let's go ahead and get to the game. So Pierre had the black pieces here, and the game begins with a Stonewall Dutch. White plays d4 here, and we transpose, and d5, signifying the Stonewall, this structure right here. And the game often kind of develops a little slowly after this happens. It's a very stable structure here in the center. Uh, black commits to this, uh, to allowing this outpost on e5 very early. But at the same time, black gets a very strong, stable grip of the center. They're probably going to plop a knight on e4 at some point, and sometimes they just slowly build up on the king side. So let's see how the game goes. Bishop g5, bishop e7. Both sides are developing their pieces. Castle, rook c1, knight b to d7, and castles. And yeah, Pierre mentions that white might be a little better here because of this bad light squared bishop from black. That's one of the big downsides of this structure, too. In addition to kind of its inflexibility, its you know early commitment to allowing this outpost. Um, the other big downside is this bishop's really bad, right? All the pawns are on the same color as the bishop, and it doesn't really do a whole lot from c8. In fact, there's one maneuver that sometimes happens later in the game where the bishop even comes to d7, e8, and then out to h5. Um, you know, to activate that bishop finally, but that can take a little while to organize. So black goes ahead and plays knight to e4. So full disclosure, I don't have a whole lot of experience playing the stone wall myself, um, but what kind of appeals to me here is playing h6 actually, just because now white's either going to have to exchange on f6 and give away the bishop pair, which I always like having the bishop pair, just, you know, most of the openings I play, it's good to have the bishop pair. Maybe in the stone wall it's a little bit different, just because the center is kind of locked up and, you know, you want to throw a knight on e4. But the position can still open up. It's always easier later in the game to open up the position than to keep it closed, which is one of the reasons the bishop pair is so good to have. And if white doesn't want to give me the bishop pair, if they play something like bishop f4, I'm just wondering if this bishop might be a target here for us to expand with g5 and g4, or g5 and f4, or just g5, uh, whenever it comes time to start building up on the king side. Maybe this is a little bit too ambitious. It would definitely have to uh, be prepared carefully here. I don't think we can go crazy here on the king side without all our pieces in the game yet, but it's an idea. I know a lot of times black does want to build up on the king side and keep this just keep the center very stable and slowly build up on the king side. That's one common plan in the stone wall structure. After knight e4, uh, white goes ahead and exchanges off those uh, bishops. And now he took on d5. Now my instinct here is that this is not a great move unless there's some kind of tactical justification because you're really allowing black to solve this bishop's problem a lot easier if you allow them to play e takes d5. All that happened is that the c-pawn disappeared and the e-pawn disappeared, and it seems to me like that definitely favors uh, black. This, this c-pawn was a lot more valuable than the e-pawn, and now this bishop can develop to e6 at some point. So I don't think I would play that move unless there's a tactical justification. This sometimes works out when like the f-pawn's undefended early in the opening, but here, I'm not really seeing the justification, or if there's some pin on the C file that you want to exploit, but I don't, I don't think so here. Some of White's typical plans in this structure, uh, going back after Queen takes E7, uh, one possible plan is to just get a knight on E5. Sometimes White will even uh, play, play a maneuver like knight E2, knight F4, knight D3, to have both knights eyeing E5, and then a knight will hop into E5, so that if you exchange it, the other knight can sit there. And then you get a very typical, uh, let's just get rid of the arrows, then you get a typical um, good knight versus bad bishop situation, right? There's no minor piece that black would have left that could eliminate that guy, and white just wants that minor piece domination of the good knight versus bad bishop, so that's one plan. Two other white plans in this structure are a pawn storm on the queen side, something like uh, b4, b5 here, although it's a little inconsistent with this rook already being on b1. White might want to have both rooks come to the, to the queen side files if this is white's plan or uh, playing for f3 and e4, really trying to blow everything open in the center, get rid of this stable center black's trying to maintain, and try to expose some of the weaknesses that are going to be left behind here uh, with the black king getting opened up. So basically expand on the queen side, expand in the center with f3 and e4, 
or just really try to dominate this weak e5 outpost. Those are three of the main themes of white's play in this kind of position. I guess one, one fourth option to mention is sometimes white will counter with a stonewall structure himself, something like moving this knight away somewhere and then playing f4 and getting this really locked center. That's another possibility. Anyway, c takes d5, e5, queen c2, king h8, just tucking that king away from any uh, possible tactics later, and white goes ahead and plays knight to d2, and Pierre played knight d to f6 and called this possibly an oversight because he's worried about the e5 square uh, now that his knight's not eyeing it. I don't think it's an oversight, though. Um, I mean, white's going to be able to dominate that square eventually if they want to. Um, but you're pretty active here. I think all your pieces are standing well. Your bishop can even develop now, now that the e6 pawn's out of the way. I think black's doing all right here. I think this is fairly close to equal, actually, at least from my, my assessment here. Bishop b2, bishop d7. Maybe you still uh, want to come around the long way. That's probably fine, too, at some point. Knight to f3, coming back towards the e5 square. And yeah, here you played knight g4, and you said you kind of found out this is a waste of time, because after h3 you have to move away. I'm guessing you played this to try to keep the knight out for now. But yeah, whenever you play a knight like this into g4 or you know b4, you always do have to ask what's going to happen if it gets kicked away. And here there is no real good answer except to go back. Um, you mentioned the possibility of taking here on f2 and just call it unclear. I'm not sure if that's unclear. I think this is just clearly bad, at least from my assessment here. If we give up the two knights for the rook on f1, which really was doing nothing for now, yeah, this, this can't be good, I don't think, because this knight's going to hop into e5 immediately. Now we can never get rid of it. In the middle game, the, the, the two minor pieces are just usually better than a rook, plain and simple. In the end game is when point count values tend to be the truest. Um, and there, you know, with all the open files, the rook might have a chance against the two minor pieces. But I'm just envisioning so many ways the two minor pieces are going to run all over you here. Maybe if we can immediately open up some files, we can justify it. Like, if, can we play f4 here? But I think white can just play e4. And we definitely don't want to allow e5, I don't think, or e takes d5. So if we take there... Yeah, knight e4. Yeah, this is this is just better for white, clearly. Okay, so knight g to f6, uh, or sorry, after h3, yeah, you did just retreat to f6. That's pretty much the only good option there. And now knight to e5. Rook a to c8. I'm kind of curious what your plan is. You don't give too many annotations over the next couple moves. Why, why c8 for the rook? I'm wondering if this is geared towards trying to play c5 yourself, or just kind of being on guard against some of white's ideas over here with the, the minority attack. Um, I know sometimes black puts the rook on g8 and f8 in this structure to try to play g5 and play on the king side. I feel like that might be a little too ambitious here. White might just be able to open some lines up, and I think your king might be worse off than white's own king. So it is kind of tough to, har to, to find a plan here. I'm still kind of liking bishop e8 and bishop h5, though, just get getting rid of your bad bishop. That seems to make sense to me. Anyway, rook a to c8, queen a4, a6, defending that pawn. In b4. So white's playing the minority attack here, right? They have a pawn minority on the queen side, right? Two against three. Uh, but if they can play a4 and b5 here, they're going to be able to induce a weakness in the black position. Because if you allow them to exchange on c6, you're going to have a backward c pawn, right? And if your c pawn captures on b5 and that exchange happens, you are going to have an isolated d pawn. So that, that's the point of this minority attack, marching the pawns on the side where you have fewer pawns uh, and a semi-open file to try to induce weaknesses. Okay, rook f to d8, a3, I guess white's just stabilizing this guy for now. Bishop b8, queen d1, knight takes c3. And you call that a bad move because your, your knight was more active here than their knight. Um, yeah, I kind of agree with that. It might be nice just to leave your knight here, you know, force them to play f3 and commit to that, you know, kind of committal move if they want your knight gone. But the fact that you have another knight ready to hop into e4, I mean, I don't, I don't think it can be called a terrible mistake here. Knight takes c3, rook c3, your other knight comes to e4, rook c2, and you go right back to f6. Huh, okay. So it kind of feels to me like you're having trouble coming up with a plan here, too. I think we should play on the uh, on the king side here for sure, because we have this typical, you know, it's called the Carlsbad structure, right? White has the semi-open C file, we have the semi-open E file, and both of our D pawns are in the center. This is a very common pawn structure from a lot of openings. The queen's gambit, some lines in the Karo pawn, 
And oftentimes, uh, white's plan is going to be to expand on the queen side with this minority attack, and black tries to play on the king side. So, queen d3. There's also some other ideas, by the way. For example, in some cases, we can lock down the queen side. Like, imagine if we could play at the right moment in something like b5, and then quickly a knight into c4. That could shut down a lot of white's play on the, on the queen side, but we have to be careful with that, because if we ever push this b-pawn and our, our idea doesn't work out, we're still left with this backward c-pawn. So just an idea to keep in mind. Okay, we play queen e6 to defend our pawn. Bishop to f3, knight d7, just trying to exchange off this uh, annoying knight. White goes ahead and exchanges. And rook, rook c to c1, interesting. I'm wondering why white doesn't just play uh, rook f to c1 and go ahead with you know some kind of minority attack idea to make progress on the queen side. I think white's clearly better here because... Black's attacking ideas don't seem very realistic now, with the material so reduced. And white just has an easy plan to play a4, b5 at some point and create weaknesses. And they have a good bishop, and black has the, the bad bishop. I know you say that both bishops are somewhat inactive, but his bishop's going to be playing often, so to speak, right? It's going to be attacking this potentially weak d5 pawn, or the potentially weak c6 pawn, after this minority attack occurs on the queen side. And your bishop is kind of going to be playing defense if things go according to plan here for white. But rook c to c1, I can't really picture what white's trying to do. I guess I'll have to, to figure it out. Bishop g6, white goes ahead and uh, gets away from that bishop. Rook to f8, yeah, I think the rook's more active there. Bishop e2, I guess white wants the bishop's support on the, on the queen side. Rook c to e8, bishop d3, f6. Okay, so you've kind of settled upon the plan of trying to play f4 here, and white plays g3 to stop you. Yeah, I'm really not sure why white won't just push their own agenda in this position. They've really done nothing the past few moves. If I was white here, I would have liked to try to enforce my own will on the position to play on the queen side, start inducing weaknesses, instead of just reacting to all of black's ideas. But now white plays g3 to stop f4. And you decide to play it anyway. That's really interesting. So you, you decide to play f4 here as a pawn sacrifice. So I admire the creativity for sure. There's a lot of players that wouldn't consider making this move. But at the same time, I am kind of skeptical of this. There's The material on the board is really reduced here, especially now the bishops might be getting exchanged. And I'm just not seeing anything clear we're going to get for this pawn. Maybe we'll be able to make a couple threats, but I'm, I'm not convinced we're getting enough to justify sacrificing a pawn in the endgame here. And I'm just wondering why we have to rush. Can we even build up a little slower and even play g5 and f4 at some point? Especially now that white's committed to g3, their own king is going to get kind of opened up if we get to implement this idea. So it won't be only our king that's weak. I'm wondering if we can just play bishop h5, possibly threatening to come into f3 at some point. f3 and e4 is one idea. White can maybe stop us from doing this, but we also have the idea to, at some point, play uh, g5 and f4. And we, we don't have to. We don't have to commit right away, but we can just keep the options open. And I think black's doing okay here. I think this, this looks all right. I don't think we have to sacrifice a pawn. But we play f4, and white goes ahead and accepts that sacrifice. So yeah, your idea here was to just generate this threat to the h-pawn. But I don't really see a follow-up. I think it's just really a one-move threat. And after h4, yeah, I'm not sure what we really have here. Queen g4, rookie one... Are we ready to... There's no sacrifice that works here, is there? Yeah, we can't take here because of the back rank. And the queen can swing over too if we take this guy. So there's, there's no sacrifice that works here. And I think white's going to be able to even exchange queens off at some point after queen d1 if we're not careful. I don't think g5 ever works. Yeah, just with only major pieces on the board, it's really hard to make an attack like this work because you're so kind of one-dimensional. You can only attack on the, the ranks and files, really, except for the queen. King g8. Um, I'm wondering what the point of this was. I wonder if you're just trying to avoid the back rank issue so you can threaten rook takes f4. Now queen e2. Can you play queen g6? Could we play queen take, uh, rook takes f4 here? You don't mention the possibility. So if we play rook takes f4, they can't take us. They can give this check. We have to come back. Looks like we want our pawn back in this line. I don't see anything white can really do here. I think we just want our pawn back. Okay, after checking with the computer, though, it does refute this idea. I don't think you saw this possibility, but after rook takes f4, 
Uh, it, it turns out white has a funny line here. White can just exchange queens and play f4. <laughs> and it turns out it's actually really hard to, to deal with this situation where our rook has very little mobility. White's threatening to play king h3 and start rolling these pawns really fast, uh, potentially threatening a fork along the way if we're not careful, and white's also threatening to come down to e7 kind of at any time. So okay, may maybe it doesn't work because of this idea, where after rook takes f4, we win the pawn back, but the double rook in game is actually unpleasant for us after f4. But I don't think you saw this idea because you didn't mention it. I'm just wondering if this is uh, if this was kind of on your radar, this rook takes f4 uh, idea. I mean, you, you had to be looking for attacking ideas, right? That's why you, you sacrificed the pawn in the first place. So I'm wondering if you were at all considering any of these sacrifices. Okay, but after queen e2, you went ahead and just played queen g6. Queen d2, queen f5, rook e5. Yeah, looks like just some, sh some shuffling around there for a second, but white's really taking up residence on this e-file. And if we can't do anything fast to the, to the white king, we're really just down a pawn. And, you know, with white having the open file, I think black's in big trouble here. Yeah, queen f7, rook e1, queen d7, rook e7. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, black's definitely in big trouble here. Down a pawn, and white's completely dominating that open file. Rook f6, queen e5. Okay, some exchanges occur, and we get to this endgame. And this move shocks me. White plays king h3 here. How how can you not play rook e7 here if you're white? It seems like such a natural move, right? I don't see any urgency to, to play king h3, right? There's nothing really going on over here that needs our urgent attention. But we only have one chance to play rook e7. After rook e7, I think the game's almost over. I mean, what, what does black do to defend all the pawns here? You play b6, the rook's going to come around and start picking up pawns. And we really have no counterplay here for black. It's going to take a while to organize. So I think rook e7 is just a clean win for white. At least it should be. You're going to be up two pawns in the rook in game and more activity. I think white's, yeah, white has to be winning after rook e7. Anyway, king h3. And white went ahead and gave you a chance to play king f7 and, and kind of keep yourself alive. King g4. White's trying to expand over there on the king side. Oh, and you offer an exchange of rooks. So I know you really want the e-file. But kind of the number one rule of defending rook in games when you're down the pawn is, is not to go to the king and pawn endgame, right? Because the king and pawn endgame is usually a win for the player with the extra pawn. The rook endgame gives you good drawing chances. And white wasn't really threatening anything on this file anymore. After king f7, I mean, what, what's the rook going to do here? The rook can't come to any of the key squares right now. So I, I don't think we should offer the exchange of rooks. Maybe you're hoping that because white's pawns are doubled that you have a chance to survive this king and pawn endgame. But I don't really think we do. I think white can just go ahead and exchange rooks, and uh, and I think that should just be a winner for them. Let's let's just check to make sure. I think white can just take, take, play something like g4, king f6, I guess, to stop g5 for now. The point is, it's going to be kind of hard for for black to organize getting a pass pawn here too. Like, what are they what are they going to do? They have to play b6 and c5 at some point. It's it's really their their only option to get a pass pawn here. But their king has to be in that vicinity for this to work, otherwise white's getting the faster pass pawn, potentially. And if the king's ever in this vicinity, white's going to be making their own pass pawn on the king side, and it doesn't seem realistic for black to hold this position. So king f6, maybe even f5 here, just trying to bring the other pawn to f4 and create some kind of a zugzwan. Black can try to hold on for the time being, but yeah, I don't really see how. Maybe b6 trying to make a pass pawn, f4... F3. Yeah, what does is, what is black do here? <laughs> I, I can't really find a, an answer for them. King E7, G5. Yeah, yeah. Just in general, when you're defending the rook in game, you don't want to go to the king and pawn in game. That's one of the worst things you can do when you're defending it, unless you're sure it's a draw. Or unless the rook in game is so bad that you, you have to exchange rooks. But I, I don't think we're forced to exchange rooks yet. Like I said, I know the rook looks menacing on the open file, but I think we can just let it sit there for now and just shuffle around. Make white prove something, right? If white tries to prove something here and white starts pushing pawns and exchanging them, some other file is going to open up. We can get our own open file for our rook. We don't need to contest this file yet and risk going to that king and pawn endgame. So rook e6, white doesn't go to it yet, but they eventually do. They kind of expand on the king side first, and now they go to the king and pawn endgame. Okay, king f4. Ooh, and b5. So I'm wondering why b5. I think this is hopeless for black just in general, because white's just going to create a pass pawn. Uh, but playing b5, 
Wouldn't you want to create your own passed pawn at some point by playing b6 and c5 or something to make use of your own pawn majority, this 4 on 3? By playing b5, now it seems hard to ever create a passed pawn, except by a sacrifice with c5. Um, yeah, I think we want to keep our pawns more flexible and play b6 and c5 or something as kind of a last-ditch effort. But apparently this worked in the game. I'm really curious how, how white blew this. Let's see. So h6, take, take, here. And I think all white has to do is like play h7 and, and come to uh, to d6, right? Unless unless the c5 idea works. So it worked in the game, I saw. So let, let's see what happened. h7, king g7, king e5. They took. Now they played f4. I'm pretty sure they just win if they play king d6, right? Like there's nothing going on there except white's taking all your pawns. f4 here. King e6. Okay, so White's just trying to promote promote this pawn right away, but they forgot about your breakthrough ideas. Yeah, if White if White didn't forget about your breakthrough ideas, then after King d6, I think the game's over. But King e6. Okay, and yeah, you found this this sacrifice idea idea to play c5 here. Now I don't think it actually works. <laughs> it's a nice last ditch effort, um, and Black probably shouldn't shouldn't have even allowed this. Black should have just been gobbling your pawns. Uh, but now. White took on d5 and allowed you to get this protected passed pawn. Instead of that, can't white just take on c5? I think your pawn's too slow. White's going to be making a queen here before you. Here, yeah. And white white still wins this. But good good last-ditch effort, right? You said you're in time trouble, so, so why not go for it? So c5, and white blunders and takes on d5 and allows c4. And miraculously, you've managed to save yourself here. So king e4, king f7, king e3 takes, and I know this was all kind of uh, time trouble. Wow, and after this move, I think white should be losing, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, after king c3, white's putting himself in zugzwang. After king d5, he's going to lose the pawn. What white had to do here was always make sure that if black was going to play king d5, that he would always be ready to play king e3. White should just shuffle around, play something like king e2, and now if the king comes up, now he can always come to e3, and everything will be defended. Maybe maybe a little hard to find that in time trouble if you're not too familiar with some of these some of these king and pawn in games. But yeah, king c3, big blunder. And after king d5, black's winning. Now this is really interesting because after king d5, you guys agreed to a draw. So I, I forget exactly from your annotation. For some reason, the last annotation here didn't get pulled in. But either you offered a draw or you accepted a draw offer here. I'm wondering who who made the draw offer and who accepted, but. I'm really curious why you accepted the draw here. I know it's easy to get panicked. I know you said you had about 10 seconds left on your clock. But there is a, there is a 5 second delay, right, if I'm not mistaken, uh, based on what you said about the time control. So did you see you were winning the d-pawn by force? Because black is at really no risk of losing this position. There's no way black can lose. Right, like even if you make random moves here, it's it's incredibly hard to lose this position as black. And black has all the winning chances. In fact, it's just a forced win for black. But e even if you didn't know it's a forced win for black, there's, there's no way you can lose, right? So why not play on? I mean, I, I know it's a little scary to have 10 seconds on the clock, but you're going to be able to make moves within that 5-second delay every time. Just to play it out for a bit, I mean, the, the white king has to move away, right? Unless they want to try a4, but that just gives us another passed pawn. So, okay, king c2 here. I'm just making moves kind of as fast as I can, can think of them, but it's pretty easy to just win this. Let me pick up all the pawns, and we start rolling our pawns. And I, I'm, I'm sure you know how to do the queen and king checkmate, um, you know, within that five second uh, delay. Plus, once you scoop up the white pawns real quick like that, now you can't lose even if you do lose on time, <laughs> right? Because white has no material left. So I'd be curious to hear, hear your thoughts there at the end of how that draw offer kind of uh, came about and why you decided to accept it. I know it's easy to get panicked on the clock, especially if you're not, uh, if you don't have a lot of experience playing under time pressure. Uh, but with, with that five second delay and a little king and pawn in game. It's, it's going to be enough to win. Even if you don't trust yourself, you you, you got to trust yourself here. You've worked too hard this whole game. You fought back from a completely losing position. You swindled your opponent here. They missed your breakthrough. They, they missed everything here in the king and pawn in game. You've worked too hard the whole game to throw away this half point and accept this draw offer. Because the win's right here on the table for you. You're, you're, you're going to be up a pawn in a king and pawn in game. You just have to trust yourself to be able to play it. And if you lose, if something weird happens and you, you lose on time, that's a learning experience, right? 
you know, you can you can learn from that. Although it's hard to imagine how that would happen in a position like this. But if if it happens, it happens. But you can't accept the draw offer here. I think you you really just can't. <laughs> I know it's easier said than done over the board. So uh, thanks for sharing this game with us, uh, Pierre. Um, I thought it was very instructive, really, from start to finish. There were some great opening ideas there in the stone wall, discussing the ideas for both sides, and then the pawn sacrifice, and really a lot to unpack there in both the rook in game and the uh, the king and pawn in game there. Uh, thanks for sharing. I uh, hope to see you all again soon. Uh, don't forget to check out chesspathways.com if you haven't already and sign up there, and uh, I will talk to you all again soon.